Dakshita Rajkumar has worked in the sustainability sector for over 18 years, where she is an established thought leader and influencer. Dakshita is Chief Sustainability Officer for NG, which looks at strategic directions to support energy transitions across Asia, the Middle East and Africa. She's an advocate for environmental protection with a keen interest in developing real-world strategies that balance economy, society and the environment whilst adapting to climate change and driving sustainable growth. Good morning, good day, good evening. Um, as Morris has mentioned, I'm Daxita Rajkumar, Chief Sustainability Officer for the Scope of Asia, Middle East and Africa. So part of my a remit or scope is to ensure that we implement climate adaptation plans, um, ensuring that our decarbonization solutions are driving those mitigation actions on the ground, but at the same time, you know, ensuring that we limiting our impacts against climate change. So today I would like to take you through these highlights and some of these impacts that we, we need to visualize to better understand the consequences, but at the same time, being able to address those actions on the ground. Um, a recent, and I'm sure you've all seen in, in the media recently, the IPC report uh, that was announced last year and, and now still being in discussions has come into effect where it's now or never. Uh, the big bold headlines of now or never is literally asking you to take action in the next eight to nine years before 2030 for us to stop the trajectory or work towards the trajectory of the 1.5 degrees Celsius or the well below two degrees. Now, um, sorry, I'm just um, going to click. Okay, so here we are. So putting this into context, um, I thought it was, uh, you know, uh, apt to, for us to basically understand what this means, uh, because we always see the 1.5 and we hear about the two degree trajectory, but what does this mean? Because to a normal person, 1.5 to two degrees is just a marginal change in temperature difference. Uh, and it doesn't have meaningful impact in terms of the consequences. But to date, we are currently living these consequences. And these marginal changes in temperature actually has huge consequences on uh, uh, you know, society and, and the environment per se. If we look at just the scenarios and, and put it into a snapshot, we see that just the scenario of 1.5 degrees, we're already starting to see Ah, sorry, I just realized I was on unmute, unmute. I don't suppose you've heard all that part, right? Okay, I could so you. putting, okay, great. Start on this slide, that's okay, thanks, uh, Dexita. Okay, so yes, so ultimately the goal was to highlight the impacts and put it into realization of what the 1.5 degrees actually mean in terms of concept, uh, uh, consequences and impact. So if we're looking at just 3% uh, or at 1.5 degrees, we start to see that 3% have a chance of probability of an Arctic free summer, which will result in Arctic ice melting. And this could be prolonged to about approximate two months of drought at just 1.5 degrees trajectory. At a three degree trajectory, we're starting to see the consequence extend and being longer and prolonged, where we would envisage drought for up to 10 months long. Um, now, with this being said, now we, we all think that drought is just 10 months, so we can suffice, but at the end of the day, it has you know, domino effects. The, the price of, of your commodities increase that are water intensive, uh, people below uh, 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 would reach below the poverty line due to agricultural decline just because of drought. And these are just some of the examples. Um, when you think about just the natural impacts of uh, or consequences of biodiversity, we start to see that um, these impacts affect just the natural ecosystems. We will start to see 4% of mammals losing their habitat due to this. We have already starting to see in the last, last year in 2021, where we started to see in Europe, the rampage of wildfires, both in Europe, which was Turkey, 
and uh, Greece, uh, and we all know North America, like California, are always prevalent to wildfires. We would start to see at three degrees Celsius, approximately 90% of the land surface uh, turning to wildfires or being a, a, a element to um, potential wildfires. Now, this is a concern because due to the heat waves and increasing heat waves, we start to see these conditions becoming more prevalent. So this is just putting into context what will happen um, as a result of climate action not being implemented sooner than, than later. Now, we talk about you know, the carbon trajectory of net zero by mid-century, and we talk about you know, the carbon footprint of today. But to put this into context, this was a nice analogy I had uh, wanted to present was that as much as the CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere, it's a concept of a bathtub where a bathtub has a small drain. And ultimately this is the amount of carbon dioxide being sequestered. And as a result, this is insufficient on our natural biodiversities to be able to sequester the amount of carbon being emitted into the environment. So just with this, image or analogy, it's currently representing the fact that we are as from an industrial nation emitting so much of carbon that the natural sequestration process is unable to sequester the amount of carbon sufficiently. And that is why we've seen so many organizations, countries commit to net zero. But it's key to understand that the commitments to net zero by mid-century is important to encompass all scopes, scopes one, two, and three. But recently in the IPC uh, report, it announced that just the current policies and strategies that have been put in place by 2020 are still insufficient and will reach three degrees Celsius, if not action sooner. So this is telling us that most countries are being conservative in their net zero announcements, resulting in projections of a three degrees Celsius trajectory. And as I've explained to you in the previous slides, this has dire consequences in terms of impacts. So having net zero commitments is great, but are they sufficient enough? This is the question. And we're starting to see global pressure uh, from investors, especially when it comes to ESG requirements being incorporated. Uh, we're seeing these, this global pressure being, you know, pushed on organizations, countries to drive their net zeros faster and quicker. Uh, we started to see, you know, investment banks like Lloyds Bank, um, uh, BlackRock, that are starting to reconsider investments into fossil fuel industries. And these are, are good pressures that apply to organizations to start actioning climate uh, commitments much quicker, because at the end of the day, as I mentioned, on our current policies, we won't reach the, the 1.5 or 2 degree trajectory. With this being said, energy plays a major contributor to the global carbon emissions. It contributes to approximately 45% of the global carbon emissions, which is why it is instrumental that energy or the energy transition is you know, implemented as quick as possible, that countries, organizations consider, you know, looking at clean green energy into their portfolio of, 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 you know, supporting the climate commitments. So energy being the biggest contributor will support not only the energy industry, but a lot of the, the country's uh, commodities when it comes to agriculture, manufacturing. If these energy foundation is from a clean green source, it ensures that your uh, carbon targets and your carbon commitments are reached much quicker, which is why we as NG have positioned ourselves as an in independent power producer globally, we have produced, positioned ourselves as a major contributor to ensuring a just transition and supporting governments and, and industries through their energy transition journey. But before supporting our, our commitments to other stakeholders, we ourselves have ensured that we look at our strategic directions to ensure number one, a net zero carbon by 2045, 
looking at our increasing our uh, commitments to renewables and supporting that energy transitions by 80 gigawatts by 2030. At the same time, supporting clean green solutions, which is introduction of hydrogen uh, in terms of <clears throat> hydrogen capacity of four gigawatts by 2030. All of these commitments are what we have aligned to when it comes to our own net zero carbon emissions by 2030 uh, and 2045. We are science-based target certified. So that is why by 2030, we will achieve a well below two degree trajectory through our commitments and actions on the ground. When you delve deeper into these actions to reach 2045, you'll see, as I mentioned, 80 gigawatts by 2030. And this is our investments in, in projects of renewables in support of working with stakeholders at government level, at institutional level, and at organizational levels to support the energy transitions. With that being said, um, as I mentioned, we will reduce our carbon intensity to approximately 100 by 54% to ensure that we, oh sorry, to ensure that we manage our carbon trajectories. Over and above those carbon uh, uh, targets, we will support our clientele by ensuring 45 million tons of carbon is avoided through the products and services that we support our stakeholders with. So the roadmap to net zero always begins with measuring your carbon footprint. Now, I know most of you have already embarked on your journey to start accounting for these carbon emissions, but those that have not, this is the only way to begin the process to actually action some of those, those initiatives and meeting the, the climate commitments. So scope one, scope two, and scope three are equally important when you are addressing those accounting emissions and also addressing those actions. Now, what, as I mentioned earlier on, what we started to see is that, uh, and, and the IPC itself started to see that the current policies to reach net zero has tend to leave out scope three emissions, which is currently the biggest challenge and the highest in terms of emissions for most organizations. That is why when you are, you know, accounting for these carbon footprints, consider scope three as an element of part and parcel of your, your plan and your roadmaps to drive emission reductions. And this becomes the biggest challenge is because scope three actually accounts for your upstream activities and your downstream activities. And that is why working with your supply chain is crucial to reducing those emissions as an organization. Um, as I mentioned, as NG, we will address all scope threes, but over and above just accounting for carbon emissions, Part and parcel of NG, we embarked on a project where we started to investigate what would these climate impacts mean for us and how it's going to affect us. So we worked with an institute in France where we kind of climate modeled these projections from 2030 to 2050. Now we understand as a business that these projections or these climate impacts are real and it will affect us. The issue is that the extent of impacts and how long it's going to affect us. So that is why through our climate modeling uh, analysis and process, we looked at four types of scenarios, heat waves, water stress, floods, and extreme wind events. Now to put this into context, um, with extreme uh, uh, heat stress and heat waves, this results in uh, equipment malfunctions, uh, even though certain equipments reach very high temperatures, but over a prolonged period of time, how is it going to impact our employees on the ground from an operational and maintenance perspective? Uh, another a context to put into play is extreme winds um, may not physically impact us, but it brings about dust, uh, which affects the efficiency and outputs of solar panels. So reducing the electricity output in terms of uh, efficiency. Over and above this, uh, it increases our o &M operations when it comes to cleaning and maintenance. So when we modeled these, we looked at every single scenario uh, and how it's gonna impact our assets in the different countries and the different regions that we operate in. So based on these modelings, we are able to put climate adaptation plans into place on our greatest assets and then assets that have the biggest impact. 
So through this, we are working tediously with our stakeholders to ensure that some of those action plans um, from a, a addressing reduction to ensuring adaptation is in place to project for the future. Part of, of the climate adaptation, you will see that, you know, it involves two trajectories. One is mitigation and one is slowly around adaptation. Now, mitigation is obviously stopping or reducing uh, to the extent that you, you need to reduce, but it is also promoting clean energy, energy efficiency, sustainability, trans transportation. So as at NG, as I mentioned, we have implemented and changed our strategic directions to ensure that we stop coal investments or fossil fuel production by 2027, uh, which ultimately was a strategic direction because it affects us as a business. Uh, with that coupled, we will increase our investments, as I mentioned earlier on, by 80 gigawatts of clean energy that we support our stakeholders in the energy transitions. Over and above that, the, on energy efficiency, we will work with our clientele to support them through efficient products and services by reducing approximately 45 million uh, tons of CO2 by our clients. Now, this was you know, uh, uh, important is because we didn't need to put in this target, but we saw that through this energy transition and through our products and services, we were able to support many of our stakeholders. And by putting this target, it drives us as a business to support our clients better. On climate adaptation, you will see on uh, the fact that, you know, we need to brace ourselves for the impacts uh, that we will encounter in the future. The question is about how long and, and what's the, the trajectory and, and impact of these, these uh, climate consequences on us as a business. So putting those climate adaptation plans in place in conjunction with reduction measures are vital in ensuring that you kind of build a sustainable model for your business uh, when it comes to climate uh, adaptation risk management. Um, business continuity, as we've seen from the pandemic, is, is you know, important because this affects revenues, not only just um, operational uh, uh, accountabilities and actions on the ground. So it's important that climate adaptation is, is part and parcel of that roadmap and, and structure when you're building those climate models um, when you reach your net zero uh, actions. Specifically on adaptation that I want to bring to, to the forefront here was that investing in um, carbon sinks and nat nature-based solutions are part and parcel of ensuring those actions uh, on climate adaptations are important because at the end of the day, our natural biodiversity are the one solution that ensures natural sequestration of carbon. Now we can build in technology and solutions to sequester carbon, which is intensive and costly, but at the same time, you know, your natural ecosystems and your natural adaptation uh, um, elements such as biodiversity are less expensive, but equally important to sequester carbon. So that is why you will see that we invested in a project which was around nature-based solutions, which I will explain as we go along. But when we, we look at just the hierarchy of controls when it comes to climate adaptations, you we all know this. It starts from avoidance to eliminations to reducing, et cetera. But most important that I want to highlight here is that as much as, as you as a business need to understand your carbon footprint, and once you do, you are able to then be able to address some of those measures in terms of saying, what are those highest emissions? Where are those highest emissions? And how is it affecting our revenue as a business? And based on that, who are the stakeholders and investors that are important for us in business? And what are their plans and actions in terms of future growth? Because putting this into context helps you be able to implement the solutions today. The issue that I find in, in terms of, of the debate when it comes to implementing those climate actions is always from a financial context. And that if you don't invest now, um, the issue is that it becomes too late. And that's why we're starting to see peer pressure 
taking precedence and, and becoming so rampant at a much faster rate. So we can't wait for that. And, and this is the, the important you know, point that I want to make here is that we can't wait for those peer pressures to implement those climate actions. It's about driving those innovations through understanding your carbon emissions today, being able to build those reduction plans and you know, at the same time, letting those climate actions being those innovation trends that drive better business uh, models for the future. And really investigating what are those alternatives in the business um, that you can substitute, that you can drive efficiency before finalizing your offsets when you planning your net zero targets. Now, when I spoke about the climate adaptation, we specifically um, wanted to talk about a climate adaptation solution that we implemented here in the Middle East. It was rehabilitating mangroves with drone technology. Now, it was the first ever done in the world where it was a success planting mangroves by drones. Normally, these drones are, are implemented and, and driven by planting natural terrestrial trees and never successfully done by planting mangroves because they are such a sensitive type of, of bio-natural species that not necessarily always kind of, uh, um, you know, have a growth potential through drone technology. But this was piloted in 2020, where we started to see an immense success rate after rigorous methodology, of course, and, and testing. We started to see a success rate of about 35 to 40% uh, growth through mangroves and through drone technology, whereas naturally, this is seen through growth, or should I say a success rate of only 5% naturally. So through the natural process, mangroves can only survive about 5% and due to natural consequences like tidal waves, human activities, et cetera. So with drone technology, we have seen an immense success rate of about 35 to 40%. So this in itself, you know, and I don't wanna go into to details why mangroves is because mangroves can sequester up to four times more carbon than to the terrestrial trees, which is why we've invested in, in this type of biodiversity is because it gives us a greater chance to sequester more carbon going forward. Um, you know, to finish off basically is to really bring us back to why net zero. Ultimately, you know, Limiting to 1.5 degrees Celsius means that we need to have actionable net zero commitments and, and on the ground actions by 2045, 2044, more or less uh, on just carbon. But if we reach um, on greenhouse gas emissions, that would mean we would need to have concrete, not only policies, but actions in the next eight to nine years to ensure that we reach the 1.5 degrees trajectory by mid-century. So this is meeting that trajectory of 1.5 degrees. But if we're looking at two degrees, we're starting to see that that kind of needle shifting to about 2060 to 2070, where we need to have actionable actions on the ground by literally in the next eight to nine years so that we limit to the two degrees trajectory. It is important, as I mentioned, that through the recent IPC reports, that we are already heading to a three degrees trajectory just on policy commitments that have been announced. Uh, so we need those actions on the ground between the next eight to nine years, if we are going to attempt to meet any of these kind of uh, timelines and timeframes. Which is why, that is why NG, is committed to ensuring that we implement those adaptation plans with having those science-based targets well below two degrees by 2030 and already starting to implement some of those clean energy transitions into the, the portfolios of countries that we operate in um, so that we're building those adaptation plans to support just a 2030 trajectory. And at the end of the day, it is important that we all work together to ensure that we are committed to climate action and not just announcing glorious climate net zero targets, but having those actions in the next eight to nine years being meaningful and impactful.